Hi, this is Uncle Matt's d d Studio. I'm Matt Finch, and if you play Dungeons & Dragons, and especially old-school Dungeons & Dragons, please hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the channel, and now we'll move on to the video. Hi, this is Matt Finch. This is uh, Uncle Matt's d d Studio, and uh, I'm here with Zach Glazer and Guy Fullerton, and we're going to be, uh, this is the second video in a series that we're making about resources for publishers. And in this one, we're going to be focusing on the manuscript, um, which you presumably have or are working on at this stage in things. Um, and the, the basic theme that we're working with here is the idea that working with a manuscript is um, can be thought of best, perhaps, as editing and sculpting. And so that is where we're going to go to. And as we did in the last video, um, Guy is really the backbone of what we're talking about. Zach and I are here for comments. And since we've both worked on manuscripts, we'll have um, hopefully useful comments. But Guy, why don't you uh, go ahead and, and, uh, and take it away? OK, sounds good. So um, the first step, once you've got your manuscript sort of nominally written, um, is to go back and kind of rewrite it, revise it. Uh, you don't have to do an extreme rewrite, but generally speaking, the first draft you've written is not going to be good enough. Um, so what I like to do before I start that step is figure out who my intended audience is. You know, I want to I want to think about whether this is going to be um, an at the table module or whether it's going to be a reference work that I'm going to use before a session uh, or if it's going to be like uh, uh, a, a setting where lots of background is actually useful and won't get in the way. So figure out that, um, and that's going to kind of inform the later steps. That's kind of my my first step that I take. Okay. Um, so do you want to? Uh, are we going to be focusing on um, any of those particular categories here? Reference setting or um, at table adventure, uh, or are we breaking it into three strands of thought? How are we going to talk about those? You know, that, that's a great question. So most of my background is, is module writing. I've done like one supplement that I've thrown out to people. So I don't have a great feel for some of those other products. I, I could speak to what I like about some of those other kind of products. But, but most, of my, most of my tips that I've gotten advice are for making modules. Okay, so let's let's go ahead since we're going to have more videos in the series and um, may bring in you know other people in some of the videos. Let's go ahead and focus on uh, adventures for what we're covering here, and then we'll specifically be talking about how to edit and sculpt an adventure manuscript. That works. That works. So um, I'm sure a lot of your viewers have also read some of the ten foot pole reviews that Bryce Lynch writes. And he would be a great guest to get on as well. I would love to to hear him talk. I'd be um, a little bit I'd be a little uh, bit frightened of put of being on a show with Bryce. I think I might get scolded. <laughs> <laughs> he seems nice enough. I mean, obviously, he's uh, a very opinionated guy. But uh, some of his opinions actually drive some of my advice here. Um, basically, one thing Bryce really really pushes on is make a module focused for at the table use. Uh, and Matt, I think your Zach Smith interview that it, you just had on the other day or just pushed the other day uh, talked a lot about that in terms of like using illustrations because it's an efficient way of, of conveying information to to the reader. Um, that's the same kind of thing Bryce pushes on. He may not push it from an illustration perspective, but it's certainly one way to do it. Uh, the idea here is I'm going to be running a module that I've not, I'm not the author of. Um, I need to be able to look at it and quickly figure out what information in there is, is critical. Um, and so your job after you've written that initial draft is to go through that draft and basically tune everything for that quick glance at the table um, and throw out stuff that doesn't matter. Uh, and, and that step I really think of as revising for brevity. Um, it doesn't mean you have to throw out everything. It just means you should scrutinize the stuff that's going to be those things where you're quickly glancing at the page and you need to get that information fast. So um, to kind of dive down in that a little bit, um, actually, let me one let thing me that's kind of check. Let me stop you there for just a second, guy, because there, um, and this is probably just because you and I do it differently. But um, did you skip over, or are you waiting on the section in which you decide what kind of headers? you're going to have in there, like, you know, introduction, start of adventure, so on. Is that is that later or is that actually a preceding step that you're skipping over to talk about brevity? 
So, so I think it's actually a later step. I think it's okay. the revising for brevity fills in some of those other spaces. So let's go ahead and talk about that now because it's it's a it's a good point. So when I do my first draft of a module, um, and I've been doing this for my home campaign too, I've been trying to write my home campaign write up sort of the same way I produce modules so that I can get more practice on the module production and, and make my home campaign stuff more efficient. What I find is that my first um, uh, draft of the room write-ups has a bunch of stuff that really doesn't need to be in the room write-up, but should get pulled out to the introduction or maybe get it pulled out into a sidebar. So um, I think I think it's all part of that same process. You know, maybe you do write an introduction, but as you go through and you do your revisions, you realize that, oh, I need to add something um, take something out of a room description and put it in the introduction. So I think it's all the same ball of wax. Yeah, I think the way that the way that I tend to do this is that I will write the introduction based on what I think the adventure is going to be. In fact, it's often one of the very early steps for me um, is writing the introduction. And then by the time I'm done and rewrite the introduction, it is a completely different adventure being described there because it's evolved during the process. But for me, the introduction helps me to keep focused on what all is going to be in there, and then it changes. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I think I do something similar, but not identical. I, I usually have um, like a goal for the adventure and I don't mean a play goal, but but like this is this is the kind of environment I want it to be or whatever. And I will write that down. And that, that sounds kind of similar to yours. Uh, and I can use that to inform my later design. But like you said, sometimes that initial goal or initial introduction is not how it ends up. Yeah. Well, I find when I actually, when I was um, doing two boxes I did that I used the early sections as, as my outline and they would evolve to become much more as I'd go and write to some of the events or some of the NPCs, I would um, kind of uh, detail them out a little bit and like tighten them up. And so I would constantly refer back to it myself as it was a tool. And then at some point I would, I would completely rewrite it based on the new notes. And so it was a lot like Matt's, I guess, in the fact that I've, having two open files that would have information, I would never keep them both together. I'm just not that efficient. So as using my document beginning section as my uh, organizational section as well. So. Uh, yeah, I think that's one of the things that you, um, we're here, we're, you know, what we've got is we're assuming that we have a finished manuscript here of some kind, and it may be, um, uh, you know, depending on how, um, polished you are as a writer and obviously we're talking to people who are all the way from you know super polished freelancer all the way to somebody who's putting pen to paper really for the first time ever to write um, something like this that they're going to put out there um, there are four um, sort of common introductory parts that are used to direct a, a cold reader um, into the adventure and, and guy made a really important point early on about the fact that this person has never read what you're doing They don't have any of the background information that you sort of are taking for granted whether consciously or subconsciously when you're writing it and how to work people into it and it's generally and In almost every adventure that I've written. I ended up changing these template introductory blocks but a lot of them start out with an introduction and sometimes people use the introduction to talk about you know here are the conventions where i play tested it blah 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 um most uh, that it would often i think fit more into a forward and then the introduction is telling you um sort of here's what this adventure is going to be about and then when you get from there then you start giving people um functional information about it and that's where um, you've usually got three different areas um, to organize that into one of them is the backstory or the history um, and the reason for that um, is again it's a, an easy way to work somebody into it and begin to develop you know the villains that might be in there or the threats that might be in there um, and then there is also and in varying orders there's usually um, uh, if there is some overriding environment risk that's in there or something that shows up many times, people will often have a little section about how that works. Um, if that's not the case, then people will usually skip it. Um, and then you have a section that is sort of the player beginning because what you tell the players 
um, is not going to be anywhere near what you have described in the history and the backstory of the place, because a lot of that's secret. It's mysteries that people are going to be uncovering. And so you've got a section where it's like, this is what the players know when they start. That may be where you have a rumors section. If you're working in a rumors section, it may be where you give people um, one or more adventure hooks that can lead them into it. Um, and then you begin with some sort of geographical um, sort of root set of room description things. And then often you end, you know, with some sort of concluding material. But if you think about what your sort of chapters, quote unquote, are going to look like that can also let you early on bracket the information at least even if they're placeholders it's like when guy is talking about working through discovering that his room descriptions that's where he's beginning to write in new elements of backstory or something like that um you've got a place you know in your little word file that you're typing away on um you, you have a place to put that now and so you begin assembling you begin moving blocks of text around uh to where they belong and that's um i think that's you know that is a major editing function and then after that i tend to look at the brevity because i really don't know how long these things are going to be until i'm done with the writing process and i see good lord my introduction is 44 pages long uh, because that's where I, you know maybe my backstory is a little too intricate or maybe some of the backstory needs to be moved into the room back into the room descriptions so that it flows right um so that um so guy why don't you talk about various possibilities for um that overarching sort of outline of the adventure and Can then I ask let's a move question on to first before you move to, to an outline no oh, go ahead oh. When both of you guys are doing like your intros, do you think in advance of like presenting information in tables? Like you, you just mentioned rumors. And like when I would do that kind of stuff early on, knowing it's going to be a table, do you guys do that? Knowing you have information you're pretty sure will not be in a standard like format and you already have that like set aside or thinking of where to put it. For me, the answer is yes and no. Yeah, I, usually I, I have some idea of what I want to have a table and not have a table, but um, that can end up changing. I, I think at layout time, there are sometimes situations where I have non-table information that I put into a table specifically for like, like layout and visual design purposes. I don't yeah. think I do the opposite so much, but I think in, in a lot of cases, there are places where I know I want a table, like rumors. Rumors are one of the common ones, yeah. And so, you know, and this is one of the things about to making decisions about how your thing is going to work. I'm not sure that it makes sense to do. First of all, don't do rumors until the very last. Um, just, you know, pro tip there. Um, the other thing is that, you know, for example, I don't like using. Um, I, I, I do rumors in, in you know, the, the standard um, traditional old school way of doing rumors is that, that you'll get some true and some false information. Um, depending on how you roll on a table. And I prefer a method that started coming out in later editions where really it's all true. It's just more useful or less useful um, depending on like what you spent or, you know, how good you, you know, who did you talk to? What kind of effort did you put into, you know, the gathering information phase of things? And so everything that I put, tend to put in is true because I think there's there's no real way of knowing what's false. You know, that, you know, is is more atmospheric. And I think loses part of the whole thing about giving the players meaningful decisions but um so often i i do tables specifically because it's like you know were you at, at this category of information gathering this category of information gathering or super duper awesome information gathering where you're getting you know unusually useful little pieces okay i was just curious because i can't i have a harder time separating between the manuscript part and the presentation part because I've only done a few and I was a one man machine. So it would occur to me early on, what was it look like on a page even before I learned InDesign because I cared about that stuff a lot, but I was just curious if you wrote the tables is all. Sorry to have interrupted. One oh, of the no, maybe, sorry. One of, one of the one of the benefits is that that I work with um, Chuck Wright, um, who is the layout artist for Frog God Games, and Chuck loves making tables in layout. So oh yeah, so okay, you know he's told me that he told me he loves yours especially. Yeah, so. yeah, especially when you nest one table within another. So that one he says that's a challenge that he's up to. Yeah. So okay, excellent. Wow. Well, I don't want to be him. I do not like making tables. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I want to go back to one thing uh, you mentioned earlier, Matt, about the introduction and, and actually the introduction and all those sort of early matter pieces. I, I agree strongly with the order you threw out there. I think a lot of products put things in the wrong 
or make it harder to use. Um, like you said, that that starting the player stuff needs to be right before the geographic um, or first story element if it's a story based module. Uh, the only other thing I want to add is on the introduction the introduction for is so the reader can figure out whether to ignore the module, to be honest. Um, you know, that's where you're going to say it's for this level range and it's this system and you darn well better have, you know, X, Y, and Z elements. Um, and if you don't put this module aside. That is really, really, really a good point about the introduction. Um, hugely important. That That's vital information. Um, so I... I Shall I just sort of dive down into some of the, the revision concepts now? Does that seem okay? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think I think we've established the fact that we've got, the, you know, that a lot of this involves looping back. This is not a linear yeah. process in which you do page one, page two, page three. You do page one, page two, page three, and then you're like, oh my God, page one sucks. And you go back to page one, and yeah. then that, that changes what's going to be enforced. So that's the first thing to understand is that we're talking about a looping process, um, even when perforce the only way we can describe it is linear but okay yeah with that said that's, that's a great point. okay so um one thing that's really hard about editing and revising your own work is that you don't really see its faults and so sometimes it's it's hard to uh make the changes you need to make um one tip i offer for that obviously a lot of people will say set aside the manuscript for a while before you start the editing and revising so you can sort of come to it fresh that's a great piece of advice the other piece of advice I would say is, is basically spam your brain. Um, if you can work on three or four projects at once, there's probably no way you're going to be as um, deeply connected with the one you're revising and editing right now because you know your, your brain is so crammed with other information. Or just read lots of other stuff. You know, make make um, make it hard for your brain to remember the fine details about what you what you wrote initially so that you can kind of revise it with fresh eyes. That's so important, um, I think, because honestly, it's so hard, especially in your very first one, you put so much effort into it and you think about it all the time that the first time you think of pulling out things, you're actually in love with ideas that it probably shouldn't be, but the fact that you had an idea and wrote it down was is the first exciting part. And so but he's right, especially reading a lots of other modules as well. You get a huge perspective on the kind of information that's important versus what kind you just love. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that all makes sense. And, and that's the hardest part is ripping out that text that you wrote, right? I mean, you're attached to it. Um, one thing that I do is I, I don't throw anything away permanently. Um, usually if I'm going to pull out some, you know, rip out some sections or paragraphs or whatever, I'll paste it in another document that I save. So I can always get it later. Um, that, that makes me feel better about some of those rip outs. And then I can find out during play testing or whatever, oh, maybe I need to put it back. So, um, oh, but, me, but I mean, let me. Let me throw something in there, too, because especially since we're a, a lot here, we're going to be talking to sort of an old school um, audience and a DIY audience and a group of people who understand that what they are doing is going to have a high level of individuality to it. They're going to discard some of the commercial tropes uh, that are involved in things and want to have stuff that really reflects what they're doing. That does not mean that what we're talking about right now, chopping out the stuff that's irrelevant, it does not mean that this is not equally important because you are working for a reader and you got to understand that sometimes keeping in the quirky stuff and the irrelevant stuff is good. Most of the time, however, it's bad objectively for the reader because it's going to get in the way of the quality of the thing that you're trying to express to them and you don't realize that. Um, because you're lo you are looking for that individual, and I'm not saying take out the individuality. I'm not saying to take out the quirky stuff. It's just to realize that sometimes the individuality and the quirky stuff is still something you need to trim if you want a good resource for somebody else. And that's one of the difficult things to balance when you're trying to do something that is that has the non-commercial feel to it, that has the DIY feel to it, that you're going to share to the world in general. That still means some of the stuff needs to to go if you want to have a good resource that is still quirky and individual. Sorry, I've, I'm really jumping yeah. in this time around. Go ahead. No, go ahead. no, that's 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 super great. Um, that that brings up sort of two uh, important points, and and um, one is that all the the quirky stuff, the stuff you ripped out, um, a lot of that can be repurposed. Uh, section at the end, which is design notes, 
And that can be much more free form needs to be, uh, it doesn't need to be focused for at the table use. Um, and, you know, so there's usually a way to save a lot of that content and still get it out there and still let your personality go through. Uh, and maybe it doesn't show up in the, you know, if you're, if you're making a printed document, maybe it doesn't show up there, but maybe you put it in a blog post someplace or something like that. So there's absolutely ways to save that stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so we talked about overloading your design memory. Um, Another important thing to do here is remember that the referee is a person that's smart and can be trusted. That's that's another so, uh, sort of um, comfortable thought you can have when you're throwing stuff out. Uh, there was a recent module where we had a big table of, of uh, essentially spell effects and how it interacted with a particular environmental hazard. And we probably had 30 spell effects in there and it was just too long. I mean, it made that room span multiple pages and that was not gonna be something that flew. And I realized that, you know, if I just give the referee two examples or three examples, they're gonna be able to interpolate the rest. So, um, you know, just make sure you trust the referee. You can allude to stuff without saying it explicitly. Um, so that's, that's a handy technique or at least, um, you know, comfortable pillow to land on as you're throwing out words. And that's a technique um, for that's a technique for brevity, um, which is you know we yeah. talked about the importance of that. Yeah, because it's uh, the, the only other it has to do with page usage as well as everything else. Yeah, so I mean, we could go into layout, but that'll have to be a future one. And that that uh, it's layout would be hard to convey over video, but um, uh, maybe in the future. Uh, let's see. So another thing I wanted to throw out there, I I'm saying some rules with air quotes on them. These rules are not hard and fast rules. They're, they're more or less just suggestions. There are many of times and places when you want to ignore these specific rules. So um, don't feel like you need to be a slave to them. That's, that's another important thing. There are times when you want a section to be long and more flowery. So, you know, don't make everything super, super concise. Um, okay. I, I'm going to kind of hop around a little bit uh, and I'm going to talk about some specific techniques for making things brief. Um, one thing I like to do recently is sentence combination. Uh, you might write two or three sentences about the same thing, find ways that you can rip out uh, identical nouns um, or identical verbs and, and recombine three sentences into one. Uh, that's a great way to make things shorter. Uh, and it'll also force you to prioritize uh, one of the things, one technique I use for that specifically is, is I'm writing, as I'm reading a paragraph, I will write down a list of the key words in the paragraph, the key words and key ideas, just like single words or short phrases, and then take those and see if I can recombine all of those into one sentence. So basically take one paragraph, extract the important bits, and then rewrite just one sentence. Um, a, good, another, a, a, good, a good trick for, for figuring out when you can do that, too, is reading it out loud. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I forgot about that one. I should have written that down in these notes. Um, Tim Shorts is the name that jumps in my head. I think he's got some articles on editing where he talks about that specifically. It might also be Rob Conley. I think the two of those guys work together. Um, but they, they have some really good success with the reading out loud technique. It really does let you know where you've got some clunky language. Well, I find that one thing that I use that I never thought I would, word clouds. I, I, for longer sections, not just like a paragraph, but for maybe like four or five paragraphs, I'll throw in a word cloud in Word, and it comes back with a visual image of words I've overused. And I'm looking not so much for game words or for modular ones, but actually just for standard English. It's like, why on earth does it say whatever nine times in five paragraphs? And that helped me edit it down for not just clarity, but to avoid seeming amateurish, I think. And I just, it was a cool tool that I never thought would be valuable, except as a visual, like, share so i recommend that one too yeah absolutely um i want to throw another tech technique out there instead that's that's uh not really instead but uh, a non-writing technique i think sometimes people write uh several paragraphs describing a thing and those several paragraphs take up a lot of space in a column uh, or in a page um if you really feel like you need that detail of a written description, maybe use an illustration instead. You know, a lot of times uh, the illustration can actually be smaller, show more, 
um, and show everything that you were trying to write in the first place. And that's going to be good enough uh, for most referees. Um, of course, that can end up being more costly if you're commissioning the illustration. So there's a balancing act there. But um, consider that if you've got something that's, uh, you know, a very long visual description of, of a room, for example. Um, okay, so I, I want to touch on a few uh, language use details, and I'm not sure how well they're going to come across in a video, so I'll do my best. Um, but at worst, I can point to some online articles about this uh, in the comments of the video. Um, I, I generally recommend avoiding active voice as you write. And so the big question is, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I got that backwards. I, rec I recommend avoiding passive voice, use active voice instead. Um, and, and now I need to explain what those two are. So passive voice is when you do not explain what is doing the doing in a noun verb situation, um, or when you explain who is doing the doing after the verb. The best way to uh, explain this is with an example. Um, you might have a door in, in a dungeon that's going to be opened by some monsters, um, and you might write it as the door gets opened by the monsters. Um, and th that's passive voice because the, the opening is more prominent than who is opening it. The downside with passive voice uh, in the worst case is that you don't actually identify the, the creature who is doing the opening. And that makes your reader tilt their head and think, what, what's going on here? Because you're not giving me all the information. Um, the, the better case is where you do explain who's doing the opening, but you do it afterwards. Uh, and that's still, it's not confusing, but in that case, it ends up being longer than active voice. Um, and one of the reasons we edit for brevity is to let the user get the idea in fewer words and fewer words also make the layout easier. So if you had a sentence like the, the door was opened by the monster, the obvious rewrite for that is the monster opened the door. And if you try typing those out, you'll see that the monster opened the door is obviously a lot shorter. One of the tricks that's, um, been out there for that and it actually kind of works in a dungeon so it's not the best trick maybe but if you can insert the word if you can insert the words by zombies in your sentence you're using passive voice so the you know the the door was opened by the monsters if you can substitute the door was opened by by zombies then you've got passive voice or if you've got you know the door will be opened and you can add by zombies in there then you've got passive voice uh, voice. Whereas if you've got the monsters open the door by zombies doesn't work. Cause you, you know, by zombies open the door, that didn't work. You know, the monsters open the door by zombies doesn't work. But if you can put by zombies into the sentence, then that's passive voice. I can, I can back up that guy cares a lot about making sure that happens. Cause when I gave him my manuscript, my very first, his very first, I looked at this over the other day. Um, the very first thing he said was passive voice. And what it did for me was it, <laughs> All the clever wording I was so proud of, all the things that I thought were clever turns of phrase, turn out to be passive. And it actually, it's a great advice because usually you're the only person who thinks those are clever are, is yourself. When you're writing by yourself for hours on end, you'll write sentences in a way that, oh, that's pretty clever. And it turns out to be passive and hard to understand. And so that does close it out. And he does believe in that. It made it much better. So I'm, I'm glad that helped. Um, the, uh, so uh, along the same um, in the same sort of family of, of edits as the, the passive voice, active voice is the removal of to be verbs. And I realize as I'm saying these things out loud, I'm actually using them a lot as I talk, which is not great. But uh, to, be, to be verbs are things like is and was, were, um, and all those, those uh, conjugations of to be. Um, and the reason you want to get rid of those is often when you're using is like uh, or work some goblins are in the room um, is that's not conveying a lot of activity or flavor so that's problem one it's not as strong a writing problem two is that when you have that initial sentence you probably followed it up with they are playing cards or they are torturing a rat or whatever so you usually have a second sentence that also has a to be verb in it that actually identifies the action so 
in those kinds of situations, um, you know, take the goblins and take the fact that they're torturing a rat and rewrite it without using is or was and just make it be goblins torturing a rat or something along those lines. Um, it'll be more evocative and it will also be short. Um, did you want to say something, Zach? I saw you move there. Well, I was just actually going to ask about a, uh... We were talking about the length and of like stuff with descriptions, and you guys mentioned earlier about moving them to um, the introduction. Do you think in advance about putting things like in appendices or things like you don't want to get rid of because it's you think you find it valuable, but it may be actually too long, and you want to keep the actual content part where they're doing the adventure for the table short. Do you think in advance I'm going to put this in an appendix or I put further information and just reference it? Is that something that it's commonly happening when you're revising your manuscript or? Um, for me, I've, I've been training myself to use sidebar, sidebars more as I do my initial write. And I, I think sidebars are kind of the answer maybe to what you're saying. Um, you know, there are times you, you're you writing a room description, let's say, and, and you've got two kinds of information in there. You have the basic description, and clearly that basic description needs to be in the key. But then maybe you have some backstory that will... Uh, you know, inform how the referee thinks about the, the the room or the encounter, or maybe there's like some design notes about, well, okay, this room is about this particular kind of challenge and you need to know that fact in order to run the room right. But it's not important to know that detail at the time you're running the room. It's only important to know that detail at the time you're reading through the module initially, you know, as you, when you're prepping. So I like to, uh, as as I go through and do my initial write, or as I'm revising, I do kind of break things up from room descriptions and sidebars. And the nice thing about sidebars, it can be right there next to your room description. So that if the referee doesn't really remember, um, you know, they, they can look at it quickly again, but it doesn't get in the way of the initial, these things are in the room and the, these monsters are in the room. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm jumping around here in my own notes here. You should have edited those notes before yeah. you. Uh... So I sort of did. It's just edited with text, or sorry, with 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 uh, lines, and arrows, and so that's why I'm kind of flailing around a bit. And we're back, uh, guys. Uh, microphone and. Uh, basically sort of stopped working there for a while at the end so of uh, the first segment. So this is part two of the video, which is uh, which we're going to do. And fortunately, um, Guy wrote down what we were talking about when we quit. So because it's a few hours later. So Guy, go ahead. OK, yeah, I sure did. Um, before we start, um, I want to touch on the point you made before we cut off about how my notes needed revision. Uh, revision. You were absolutely right about that much. To that much, uh, but it's a lot less. So, uh, what I have here is like nine points. They don't all take very long. Um, where we are is breaking an area key into multiple keys. Um, sometimes you'll have an area key that's really long and covers three or four things, and you don't really realize it's covering three or four things unless you consider it that way and look at it that way. If you find that you're doing that, it hard for you during playtest to find the info you need. A good thing you can do is just break it apart. And, um, that's really useful in large rooms. Okay, yeah, that's good. And we'll, we'll continue on this way. Um, okay. So the second thing I wanna talk about is leveraging the map. Uh, a lot of times you have detail that you're writing up that is obvious from the map. You know, if, if your written room description talks about how wide and uh, the room is, you probably don't need that because that's implicit on the map. Of course, you can use the map for a million other things. You can put labels for what kind of creatures are in there. You can use color for different aspects of it. Um, really try to leverage that map because at a glance, the referee is gonna be able to see what they need and you won't need to write it out in the, the area key. Um, similarly, you can leverage room titles. Uh, room titles can convey a ton of information in very few words. Like let's say you're writing some kind of module or adventure for a modern, uh, you know, modern world, and it's a gas station, and you need a key for that bathroom. If you just call it "overflowing bathroom," I bet you don't need to describe it at all. You know, the referee's <laughs> going to know exactly what you mean, 
and can carry on from there. So thank, you, thank you for that very pungent and illustrative example. You, you, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. well, you talked about being uh, brevity, and that, that certainly we get the point. It's awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's a good, it's a good example. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the, the lesson I took from experimenting with room titles was that sentence fragments are okay. You know, a lot of the writing uh, uh, instruction out there for writing regular prose says use complete sentences. But modules are not regular prose. You don't need to use complete sentences. Um, so you can really tighten things up by just saying three barrels stacked up, um, a dozen goblins torturing a rat, to use the earlier example. And you don't need verbs necessarily. Uh, and it lets the referee get a sort of complete picture. Um, the fifth thing is it's okay to use short abbreviations. And what I mean there is you don't have to follow uh, the typical uh, conventions for abbreviations. Uh, this is a module, you can think of it like a technical manual. You can do things like um, FT for feet without a period. You can do EA for each without a period. Uh, you can use save instead of saving throw. Uh, and there's a ton of other small improvements you can do like that, uh, which can make your, your text a little bit tighter and quicker to read. And it turns out that those short ones like feet and each um, make things sort of easier to spot when you do that. Uh, and then my last shotgun blast of information are things to look for in your manuscript to eliminate that is just gonna save a bunch of space. Uh, the first is the word will. You almost never need the word will uh, when you're talking about cause and effect. You, know, you can say the party opens the door, the monster will come out and attack them. You don't need will in there. You can just say if the party opens the door, the monster comes out and attacks. So those that little savings, most modules use will a ton and, and you're gonna save a surprising amount of space just by removing that. Uh, the next thing you can get rid of is explicit room emptiness. What I mean here is when you start an area description with, this room is empty except for the blah, blah, blah. You can just get rid of that this room is empty, but it's easy fact to train. Uh, what to get rid of is, uh, con I, I call them pointless conditionals, but they're really, uh, well, let me give an example. Uh, some modules say, if the party opens the chest, it contains 1,000 GP. Well, in reality, the chest contains 1,000 GP, regardless of whether the party opens it. So you can just take out that if the party opens it part. And then the last one is you don't necessarily need former purposes for rooms written out in the area descriptions. Um, you know, some some write-ups talk about how uh, hundreds of years ago, the monks used this room as a granary. And now the current description has nothing to do with that because there's goblins who have moved in and they've got their treasure in their sleeping pallets. So you could probably get rid of that former room purpose. Now, there may be instances when you want to keep that um, for background reasons, but that's one of those pieces of information that you could pluck out of that room descri description, stick it in a background or stick it in a sidebar or something more appropriate. Yeah, that's, and that's it. I, that I last got, one. No, that's it. All right, that's, cool. That's all nine. Yeah, that that last one about um, not putting in the former use of the room. Um, I do tend to. I mean, certainly not always, but you know, I I leave that in in some cases. Um, uh, as you know, and, and granted, there's this. I I I don't aim for quite the level of brevity that you do in most of the writing, but. Um, I like to do that when, because for um, because as a as a as a it, it, to to convey the feel of the place. Sometimes I like to overlap the older use with the newer use, especially if one of the dramatic things that's going on in the module is a change from one state to the next. And so sometimes to sort of emphasize, it used to be like this, now it's like this. It used to be like this, now it's like this. Sometimes that's a um, a key, a key ish feature in the thing. So, yeah, I, uh, I agree. And like I said before, a lot of these guidelines are, are just begging to be broken in certain cases. And um, there's great reasons to ignore them. Um, I mean, in a recent module I did, I, I think I named a room ruined bedchamber. And yeah, there's some stuff about a bedchamber in there. But, you know, just seeing the words ruined bedchamber is a pretty good, gives you a mental picture of what's going to be there. Um, so, absolutely 
occasionally leaving that in is good, especially like when you say, you know, there is a change going on. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, you know, I know they're all guidelines. I, I happen to raise my hand when there was one that I tend to violate more often than normal. Sorry, Zach, you were saying something? Well, I, I, I agree with you with the, uh, if, as far as the old uses or the previous uses of the rooms, I think, like Guy just said, the, the title helps a lot, but like the last box I did, Death and Taxes, it was very important as to the prior function of the, of the dungeon in the case it was a, a building to understand what happened there in order to uh, complete parts of the tasks, et cetera. And I tried to do that more though than just saying in the text, because I think that it violates another one of his rules about telling, you know, a passive voice rather than telling exactly what it was. This was the tax collector's office. It was more of what is in there and how many hints does that give you so you can figure it out to the party. Because I use flavor text on the important rooms and uh, box text. And I find that that's really useful as well. I kept, and I try hard to pull out as much as I can to keep it from being, oh, look at what I've invented here. But uh, I think it is important sometimes to have those and having them in the title does help. So. So, yeah, definitely, definitely the overlay between, you know, past uh, past use and um, current appearance. It's going to depend a lot on what you're doing. The premise, but, yeah. Yeah, I agree. All right. Now we've covered all of Guy's points. And actually, since this is the second um, half of the video, guys, should we go ahead and wrap it up at this point and then work toward the, the next one later on? It's up to you completely. I'm I'm at your service, as always. Guy, what do you think? Have we covered enough in this one, given that our topic was uh, editing and sculpting a manuscript? I so I'm I'm my bandwidth is is dying here. I, I'm getting about every other word of you guys. Okay. okay. Well, then did I answer our question. All right. Very good, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, and uh, to the audience for watching, guys, fans, Zach's fans, and uh, for everybody out there. No matter what sort of Dungeons and Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it. <laughs>